Hello, everyone. Thank you for sticking around if you're here for the second part of the patent double feature. Uh, and if you are new, that's great because I'm going to talk about some of the same, same stuff that Charles talked about, and it'll be fresh for you. Um, so the basic, uh, the basic thrust of this, um, this talk is kind of to analyze what happened last month when the Supreme Court came down with the Alice v, uh, versus CLS Bank decision. Um, because it kind of, it, it unsettled the practice of patent law and especially how software patents are approached. So the quick question, or the quick answer to the question of can you patent software uh, is yeah, um, you still can. There are very vague rules currently about what you can and can't do when you're patenting software. Um, and they got vaguer last month. But just to give you a quick idea of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to start off to talk about the basics of patent law, the foundations of it, where it comes from, um, and then we're going to talk specifically about software patents. I'm going to give, uh, give you one specific example of a patent that we can all kick for a little while. Um, and then we'll get into exactly what the legal requirements for a software patent are these days. So the uh, basic idea behind software patents, these are the, the existence of them comes out directly from the Constitution, um, giving Congress the power to regulate intellectual property, not just for software, but for copyrights as well. Um, basically, the concept being in order to incentivize people into creating awesome new things, we give them... Um, certain rights over them. And, and the idea here, it, it comes out of sort of a philosophical background of if you put your labor into something, if you create something, you should have some kind of right to that thing. And that, that is very easy to see when it comes to like developing land or making a widget, but it's a little bit harder to see and it's a little bit less of a natural fit when it comes to intellectual property. So the Congre uh, Congress has created a whole set of statutes that, that provide a framework for this. Um, and as Charles discussed earlier, a patent is ultimately an exchange. Um, the goal is if we're going to get some, if we're going to get the benefit of the, this creative effort, um, society wants the actual meat of that. They don't just want you to work in secret and create your fantastic widget and then never know how it was made themselves. So the trade that happens is the inventor gets this right, this monopoly right for a period of years, and in exchange, they explain how they did it. Um, currently, the patent term is 20 years from the date of filing. Uh, so it's a pretty long term uh, if you keep up your maintenance fee payments, uh, and, in, and you get an awful lot out of it. Uh, but the question arises of whether this actually promotes progress. And it's only until, say, the past couple of decades where that was even a question. It was, it was kind of a given. Everybody just accepted that patents were amazing. Um, to use a quote from the, I believe, the Secretary of State from Japan in the 1920s, what is it that makes the United States such a great nation? We investigated and we found it was patents, and we will have patents. So until very recently, it was, it was common, common wisdom that patents were the be-all and end-all of how you drive, like from a policy perspective, how you drive innovation in a country. Um, but there's a very legitimate point, which is that people would still make stuff even if they didn't have patents. There are a variety of other motivations beyond you know, the pure profit interest. And, and even then, uh, invention has pecuniary rewards even if you don't have an exclusive monopoly to it. Um, the, the open source movement and hackers or uh, makers are a great example because they're motivated by something other than the, the almighty dollar. Um, they're in it for passion, for curiosity, or, or whatever. Um, but there are fields in which uh, it's not so easy to, to get in, right? Part of the, part of the charm 
of, of our culture is that it's very accessible. Anybody can pick up a book and learn how to program. Anybody can, can pick up a, a $30 soldering iron and learn how to make uh, you know, something out of electronics. When you get into more abstract things and harder to develop things, pharmaceuticals are a great example, it's harder to make the case that people would put as much effort into innovation and developing new technologies in these fields because they are very hard to produce and very easy to copy. You know, once you've got this and, you know, you have to let people know what chemical they're putting in their bodies, once you've got that chemical, other people can step in and make it, even though it may have cost you tens of millions of dollars to get to the point to figure out, okay, this is the chemical that, that cures headaches or whatever. Um, so it's harder to accept that, that people would, out of a sense of passion, produce new pharmaceuticals. But, you know, every single field has its own, has its own set point. And so specifically when we talk about software patents, we have to look a little bit harder um, because we all know for a fact that software develops at a very rapid pace even outside the context of patents. People, people will get, do everything they can to get away from patents in the world of software. So what I have personally found is that the biggest effect the patents seem to have is they reduce transaction costs. Transaction costs being a term from economics which means once you've got what does it cost in order to do business, right? I'm a patent attorney. I talk to inventors. I talk to people who are, you know, in it for the first time. They've got this great idea, and they don't want to talk to anyone about it. And when you've got a great idea, and you want to make it, and you want to see something happen, not talking to anyone about it is the worst possible thing you can do to actually make it happen. But they don't want to talk about it because they're afraid of somebody taking it. Um, and, you know, writ large, that affects absolutely every single part of, of our economy. When people are no longer willing to talk about their things and, and, and come out and, and openly develop them, you end up with a much, a lot of, a lot of effort gets wasted on secrecy and a lot, uh, there's a large opportunity cost in that you don't get the feedback that you might need in order to complete your development. So the question then becomes, what can we patent? Uh, and this is uh, set out in the, in the statute as being whoever invents or discovers any new or useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter. And software is usually claimed as either a process or as a machine that's, that's sort of designed to accomplish something. So if it's not one of these what, four things, if it's not one of these four things, it's right out. Uh, but software, from the cleverness of the draftsman, uh, they, they write it in terms of something that looks right. However, there are exceptions to those four statutory categories of patentable subject matter. Um, and the courts, and it's starting in uh, 1854, the courts have recognized certain categories of exception. You have uh, laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. So laws of nature comes out of things like uh, you, can't, um, you can't patent the propagation of, of electromagnetic waves, right? You can't, you can't patent radio, or, or at least you can't patent the concept of radio, the concept of radio waves propagating through space. That said, if you had a device that in a specific way manipulated electrons to create radio waves propagating through space and you patent that device, you're not patenting that law of nature, you're patenting a specific object. Um, natural phenomenon, um, kind of a similar thing. You can also, um, for example, you can't patent uh, a cat, right? Cats have been around a long time, nature made cats. Uh, if you genetically engineer your own awesome super cat, you might be able to get a patent on that. Um, but when we talk about software patents, the key is abstract ideas. Software patents often get couched as abstract ideas when the courts talk about them because software isn't really anything, right? You can't put your hands in some software. You can't hit somebody with software, right? So ultimately, we have to find some way 
of, of phrasing software. So if we want to avoid this, it has to not seem like an abstract idea. Now keep in mind, that said, processes are patentable. So the question now is, how do we tell which one's which? And, and it's, it's worth asking why software is different. Because of all, you know, when, when you talk about an invention, you're talking about somebody who's expending effort and creativity and trying to make something new and awesome happen. Okay? So why should it be so different when you're talking about, I made this radio versus uh, I, pro I made the software for the radio? Um, my personal belief as to why software is such, a big, uh, is such a big deal for us and why software patents are such a big deal for us is because software is kind of unique in that, well, it's not, it, let me take a step back. Um, it's not unique, but, but software is a new field you know, uh, uh, the past four decades, software, questions of software have really been um, popping up in the legal world. Um, and because it changes so rapidly, you end up with situations where things that didn't, you didn't really expect to have an application now suddenly do. And so you can patent something for, for what you intended, and then a little bit later, find that it's useful for something completely different that you had no conception of when you made it. Um, in addition, because software as an industry is so new, when you patent the basic, you know, the, the basic building blocks of an industry, you essentially own that industry. And you can't, you know, other people have a lot of difficulty getting in after that point. Um, and on a, on a more direct, uh, on a direct uh, scale, it kind of offends core beliefs in our community. Um, open source is all about sharing. Uh, hacking in secret is no fun. Um, we like to talk about what we do. We like to share what we do, and we like it when other people do awesome new things with what we've done. And so the concept of patenting something on that scale it, it really sours the whole mix. Um, I, should, I should note at this point that we are talking in addition about, when we talk about software patents, we ultimately talk about a lot of different things all at once. We talk about novelty, we talk about obviousness, and we talk about the bare concept of software patents. And different people have different problems with this at each different step of the way. Most of the time when you hear about software patents, people are really talking about obviousness because that's what really gets to us. When we look at something and say, I could have done that. That's nothing interesting or new. That's just, you know, a kind of workmanlike addition of one thing to another thing. That's, that's, there's nothing there. Um, but what I'm talking about here is on a very basic level, is software itself patentable? So software patents and the attempts to patent them, or software and the attempts to patent them have been around for a very long time at this point um, in, in my scale. They've been along longer than I have. Um, the Supreme Court found in 1972 that numerical algorithms and mathematical formulae are unpatentable abstract ideas. Um, and that sort of sets the, the tone, right? They came right out and said, Algorithms are abstract ideas. So now we have to find something about software because if you just take it like that, well, kind of every software boils, every piece of software boils down to algorithms. So in 1982, the Supreme Court took it in the other direction, which is that they, somebody patented, um, this is the case Diamond versus Deer, somebody patented a, a process for curing rubber, which involved, um, a computer that calculated the exact right temperature and time at which you pull that rubber out, at which point it's no longer goo, now it's a rubber doodad. And because that, that software was implemented on a computer and it was implemented in this, in this useful technological process, that software was patentable.
so I want to I want to emphasize though the point that eligibility that what I'm talking about here abstract ideas whether those are patentable whether software is patentable is different from the question of novelty um, because there are many many bad patents out there for a variety of different reasons and just because something is obvious doesn't mean it's not eligible in the in the statutory sense right um, so here's an example this is a patent for a doubly linked list uh, it was filed I believe in 2004 it issued in 2006 um, so I would like to get a little bit of feedback here were doubly linked lists invented in 2004 well uh, somebody here up front invented them in 2003, and he should sue. <laughs> okay, I'm waiting. Okay. All right, great. Um, so I'm just going to give you an idea of what this, uh, what this patent talks about. Um, you, can you read it on there? Probably not. No. Um, a computerized list that may be traversed in at least two sequences, comprising a plurality of items that are contained in a computerized list. That's one, two, and three there. And then a primary pointer and an auxiliary pointer for each of the items. Uh, where, and then there's a bunch of verbiage. Basically, the primary pointer takes you on a first sequence through the list. The, sec the auxiliary pointer takes you through a second sequence of the list. Um, and the idea, the way it's phrased is it's very general. So you can go basically any, any path through this collection of items, um, including just backwards. And so if you have a textbook from before 2004 that shows linked lists, you will see a doubly linked list that reads on this patent. So I think we've determined now whether this is new and non-obvious. I think we all know pretty clearly that it's, it was done before. And so it's a bad patent. We can say that with some confidence. The question of the day, though, is it eligible subject matter for a patent? And I want to get your opinion on that. Based on, based on your layman's knowledge of, of what, a, what a software patent is, is this eligible su uh, subject matter for a patent? The primary pointer is not defined. The primary pointer is not defined. What is a pointer? It's probably defined in the spec. Yeah. I expect so. I I don't know if somebody once tried to invent if statements. I think probably we have them. <laughs> it's uh, no problem. But if we could keep most of the the questions towards the end, that would be great. Um, so we agree it's not new, and the question is: Is it eligible? Um, and so we have to look. Is software, does software fall into one of those exceptions? Because we can characterize software as being a process or as a machine. So it meets the first test. Um, the exceptions, as I said before, are laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. And software hinges on that concept of an abstract idea. You know, intuition tells us that this is a very abstract idea. It's just a data structure. Intuition doesn't always get us where we need to go in the law. Unfortunately, the courts have not given us a clear idea of what an abstract idea is. There are two courts in play here. There's the uh, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, and there's the Supreme Court. And the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit is a very specialized court. They deal with specific questions. Um, not just patents, they do with a, like a couple of other things, but they're all like federally, excuse me, federally created questions. So the federal circuit is kind of in the trenches. They, their goal is to make the patent system work. <laughs> and and I, I've detected a laugh. Um, it is their goal and they do, they, they take it very seriously. Right? They are not trying to mess things up. The problem is that every time they come up with a workable, reasonable rule that anybody can pick up and apply, the Supreme Court shoots it, shoots it down. 
because the Supreme Court tries to be pretty minimalist. They don't want to say very much. They want to keep it as open-ended as possible and make people think, is this an abstract idea? Um, for a long time, actually, the Federal Circuit kind of ran unchecked. Uh, it's only recently, in the past five or ten years, that the Supreme Court has started coming in and um, saying no. So in the past couple of years, here are a couple of examples. Um, the Bilski case came down in 2012. Um, Bilski dealt with, um, it was kind of an escrow thing, basically using a third party to guarantee an exchange, something like that. Um, and the Supreme Court found it to be an abstract idea. But in doing so, they shot down the, uh, the Federal Circuit's machine or transformation rule. Um, the machine or transformation rule was a very easy to apply test. We have a process or a system or whatever. Is there some actual device involved here? Or does it create some transformation in the world around it? So for example, the, the, the rubber case where they were curing rubber. That software made a transformation take place in the real world. Um, in the machine or transformation rubric, it made my job very easy as a patent attorney. All I had to do was add using a processor to one of the steps, in, you know, like calculating using a processor, and I was done. Um, so I was a little disappointed in Bilski, personally. Um, and it kind of unhinged everything, uh, because the Supreme Court just came in and said, no, it's an abstract idea. The question should be, is it an abstract idea? Not machine or transformation, though that's instructive. Um, and so, as a result, nobody really knew what the rule was. And inevitably, we came up with another case, the Alice case, which was just decided last month. Um, the Alice case was another kind of financial transactions case. If you were here earlier, Charles talked uh, in some detail about those claims. Um, and the Supreme Court, this time, came out with a test. They came up with something that at least sets up a framework, but it doesn't, it still doesn't really define its terms. And so you go through, and I'll, I'll, we'll get into the test in detail in a few minutes, but you go through and it still doesn't get you where you need to be. Um, and here's the test. Number one, you have to ask, is the claim directed to an abstract idea? And if it is, number two, is there something that makes the claim significantly more significantly more, I don't really know, um, than that abstract idea. And what's important to note here, which is, you know, and I'm, I apologize for reading off the, the slide, but this is important. Um, even if you have an abstract idea, you can still get a patent. That means if you can find something to tie your claim down to that gives it that little something extra, you still get to walk away with a patent. And the Supreme Court gave some examples of what an abstract idea could be based on their own case law from the past. Number one, idea of itself. Number two, fundamental economic practices. Both uh, Bilski and Alice came under those, uh, that one. And number three is mathematical relationships and formulas. So talking about an idea of itself, um, this is kind of poorly defined, but the, the, the gist of it is, if you have this, this idea, that, and if, you, if, if your patent's claim for this idea covers every single possible embodiment that could be made out of this idea, then that counts as an abstract idea. Um, in, my, in my personal belief, I think that that doubly linked list would count as an idea of itself. Even though it has the word a computerized list, I think it's pretty clear that you cannot implement this kind of data structure in any way now because of this patent. Um, for fundamental economic processes, you know, my, the impression I got for this type of abstract idea is that it's an abstract idea if you can reduce it to a pithy one-liner. Um, so, you know, Bilski was about hedging. Uh, Alice was about a third-party 
transaction. Um, it, you know, it's sort of like if you can boil it down to to second grader language, hedging transaction. I'm not okay. If you if you can make it short, then it doesn't count. Even if all you know, you, you might have seen the Alice claim in, in the you know Charles's talk. If you've got pages and pages of claims and it boils down to well, you do a thing to some stuff, it's it's not going to be enough. Um, and and just as a little side note, these two big software cases were both specifically financial cases. So we don't have a lot of data for other kinds of software. And then finally, mathematical formulas. This is pretty simple. Um, there was a case where the, uh, the, the only new thing in the case was they came up with a new formula. Everything else was the same. It was basically a, finding a trigger for some alarm. And, and they had a new formula for it. But because it was just a formula and that was the only new piece, the rest of the stuff that, you know, that was kind of material, maybe, maybe substantially limiting stuff, didn't really count because that was all old stuff. So as I said earlier, even if you have an abstract idea, there's a way out. And your claim needs to have that something more. The court gave specific examples again. Um, Without, without setting some general rule, they gave these examples and hoped you could sort of color in the rest for yourself. An improvement in any other technology or technological field, that was the, um, for example, the, uh, the rubber curing. That, that was such a substantial improvement in the field of curing rubber that even though you may be able to couch that, uh, that claim as an abstract idea, it had enough other stuff going for it. Um, an improvement in the functioning of the computer itself, which is something we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, and then claims with meaningful limitations, with no idea what a meaningful limitation is. Um, so improvements to other technology, like I said, um, curing rubber, uh, that's pretty good. Um, it's worth noting that, that Deere's like, claim was very clearly directed to um, a, uh, a, a mathematical formula. It actually included, it's called the Arrhenius equation that, that sets the ideal time for curing rubber. But you know, the, the equation was old. It was the software and the implementation and the effect that was new. Improvements to the functioning of the computer itself. The, this did, is one thing that did not come out of the court's case law. Um, and to me, it's really, really astounding because that's ultimately what every piece of software is for, is to improve the functioning of the computer in some fashion. Um, there, I have no idea how that's going to play out in the law. And uh, uh, you know, again, as a patent lawyer, I find this one particularly gratifying. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but when you get right down to it, you'll notice that every time I listed something, or almost every time I listed something, I followed it up with, and I don't really know what that means. Because nobody really knows what it means. Um, it's, it's a hard thing for, for serious legal scholars, not that I'm claiming to be a serious legal scholar, um, but it's going to be impossible for patent examiners. Um, out of curiosity, do we have any patent examiners in the audience? Great. Um, <laughs> patent examiners, all credit to them. My job is to make their job as hard as possible. Um, patent examiners are generally hired straight out of college with no legal training whatsoever. You know, they go through kind of a patent boot camp and they're given sort of a basic rubric for examining patents. And there's this giant manual that they get to flip through. But there's no, you know, they don't, they're not hired for their ability to determine what an abstract idea is, right? They're not hired for their ability to, to figure this out. Nobody on the planet is. Um, so ultimately, the patent office is going to have to figure out some way of systematizing this, some way of breaking the concept of an abstract idea down into at least you know, certain red flags that people can look for. Um, but the court was clear at least about one thing. 
saying that it's on a computer is not enough. This, they said this very explicitly. You can't just have an abstract idea and hang a computer on it. And you can't just take an abstract process and then say, go do it. Right? There has to be something more there to it. And, and the reason the court wanted to do this is to avoid uh, what it called the draftsman's art. They don't want particularly skilled patent attorneys to be able to walk in and just use, not even particularly skilled, just patent attorneys who, who have been around long enough to know there are some magic words. Under the, the Federal Circuit's test before Bilski, the machine or transformation test, there were just magic words that I could use, right? And suddenly this abstract idea is no longer abstract. Now it's got a machine. Um, I think, well, the Patent Office is currently struggling to figure out what's going on. They've released guidelines on June 25th. Uh, if you're especially curious, I've got a website up. You can, it's got a link to their, their guidelines. Um, the guidelines basically just repeated the uh, decision in Alice, and that's fine, right? It's not their fault because legally that's what they are bound to. They don't really get to make their own law. Um, so they have to wait for somebody else to figure out what the, what the answer is. But taking all of this and taking it back to our, our example of the linked list patent, again, I think it's pretty clear that this is an abstract idea. There's nothing here. And the court was clear that just being a computerized list is not going to cut it. Um, but as an academic question, if we wanted to save that doubly linked list patent, if we, had, if we had come up with our own brand new doubly linked list, since apparently those having happened before doesn't bar patenting them, um, how would you do that? Uh, putting yourselves in my shoes for a moment, the court gave us a couple of different ways of, of getting around the fact that you've just got an abstract idea. If we were to tie it to a specific industry, so if this was suddenly the, pat, the, the rubber curing doubly linked list, that would get us there. Um, and if we were to give it some meaningful limitations, that would, that would do it. I'm not really sure what a meaningful limitation is still. Um, oh, and of course, doubly linked lists improve computers functioning. And I hit the wrong key, and there we go. Hey, great. Um, so ultimately, we're kind of, we don't really know what's happening. Um, in terms of actual practice, the patent office hasn't changed much yet. Um, and I don't think they're going to change much yet. Um, but even so, in, in a certain way, the patent office no longer has this easy test to apply. Um, they can no longer say, well, it doesn't have a machine, it doesn't have a transformation, so you don't get a patent. Now they have to actually show to me in some way that it's, it's an abstract idea. And I have ways of getting around it that the court gave me. So, as of the past few weeks, Nothing's really has changed. In fact, nothing at all has changed. Um, the Patent Office is still applying the machine or transformation test that the Supreme Court shot down years ago. Um, there was kind of a weird quirk, and I don't know if this was an individual examiner or office policy, but I can't use the word processor anymore because that might be a human being. Um, and that's where we stand. We're still figuring things out. But ultimately, software patents are not going to go away. I don't believe that any amount of reform effort is going to change that uh, for a couple of reasons. The Supreme Court has already clearly stated that at least some kinds of software patents are eligible. Um, it's a very vague test, but there are ways that are officially sanctioned to do this. And on a, on a legislative level, although there are always efforts to reform the patent law, I don't think you're ever going to see a, a new statute that excludes software patents. The, the software industry is just too huge, there's too much money invested in it, and the patents themselves are too valuable. 
um, there's, there's this concept in constitutional law called a taking, which is what, is, what happens when the, the, the United States or some government, you know, maybe a state or a town or whatever, um, takes over a piece of your land and then has to compensate you for it. If the government were to completely invalidate software patents as a class of thing, I think there would be a strong constitutional argument that the government would then have to pay the fair market value for every single one of those patents. I, I don't see it. And uh, that is where we stand. So I've got, lot, I've got plenty of time for questions. And if you want to see links to uh, various things that I mentioned, like the uh, Alice case, the decision from the Supreme Court, the current patent uh, office guidelines, uh, a link to that patent if you want to learn how to you know, do a doubly linked list. And eventually, you know, a link to this talk itself. Um, that is where you can find it. Uh, if you want to ask a question, there is a microphone over there. Well, you, your voice is going to be on video. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer, uh, answer them. Uh, okay, Guy, if you want to yell it from there, go for it. Um, question. Sure. Are people not allowed to implement a linked list? Or, and if they did, are they now eligible to be sued under that patent? So the question is, are people allow, uh, not allowed to implement a doubly linked list and if they were to, would they get sued? Um, the answer is no and no. Uh, you know, on the face of this patent, which is a valid patent that currently exists and somebody owns it, no, the, they own doubly linked lists and every other kind of wiggly link, linked lists so you can't out there. The well, it, that depends. I, whether, whether you can implement a linked list depends on how much you respect that patent. The sec your second question was, will you get sued? The answer is almost certainly no, because this is such a clearly bad patent that they would be wasting their money. It would be, it would be nuts for somebody to try and enforce this patent. And I should say, that is not legal advice. I'm not recommending that you go implement a doubly linked list. And if you do, it's not my fault if you get sued. Um, <laughs> As, as a reasonable human being, however, I really don't think that it would be a problem. And I think that every single person who's taken an introductory level programming class had, or has done it on their own or independently invented the doubly linked list. So there are plenty of people out there who would be in line for getting sued. Um, yes, sir. So uh, two common examples of software patents, I think, are Amazon's one-click patent. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe Google's uh, page rank algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, these are discussed commonly. So with the new tests handed down by uh, the Supreme Court, um, does it open up patents like these to new attacks? Or since these have been around for a while, um, are, they, are they kind of grandfathered? Right. Um, they are not grandfathered in. You know, the, uh, the, the Alice versus CLS Bank patent was an existing patent, right? And they, they invalidated it because it was an abstract idea. Now, I don't have the Amazon one-click uh, one purchasing patent, and I don't have the page rank patent in front of me. Um, so I don't know what they actually say. And I don't know whether they have the more meaningful limitations involved. My hunch is that it's going to depend on the patent. Um, not, and, and again, not, not because of the particular language in it, but kind of what it's doing. I think it, it's going to come down to whether they're making some appreciable difference um, and, and doing something that's really genuinely new. Well, I, I, guess, I guess then my question is uh, procedurally, you know, these patents have been around, let's say, five, eight years or so. Yeah. Um, uh, Amazon goes to sue somebody or infringement. Um, there, there's a new test. Uh, might these patents be open to, to more attacks now? Yeah, yeah, certainly. You, you, you can always attack the validity of a patent when you get sued. Um, and subject matter eligibility is one of the attacks that you can levy against it. And so, yeah, you, you would have to look at it. Um, 
Whether it's a, an additional tack, whether there's more stuff available than there was before, I can't really say. You know, it was always a possibility to a, attack it as an abstract idea um, if it seemed too abstract, <laughs> right? Thank you. Hey, Ed. Uh, Hi, Alice. <laughs> um, so is there any precedent for patenting or not patenting a novel use of a previous technology or even earlier in history, um, you know, just like any device? Sure. Well, okay. So when you're talking about a device and, and you're talking about, you know, like a microphone, since I have microphones in front of me, um, that device has a structure to it. And, you know, that's one way of claiming a, a uh, claiming an invention. And another way is through a process. So that device already exists. You didn't invent it, even if you find some new way of using it. What you might be able to do is get a patent on a process, a new process that implements this device for some novel use. And, you know, if nobody has used a microphone to stir, you know, cake batter or to, 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 to do, you know, to go to war, I don't know. If nobody has used a, a, the device for that purpose before, then that's a legitimately new process. And you would be able to, uh, I don't know, depends on the thing, you might be able to get a patent. <clears throat> hey there. So, um, thank you for that very informative discussion. But what I, um, a whole other aspect of software is that they are also uh, eligible for copywriting. Yes. So, and uh, for those uh, copyrights, the processes for copyright and patents work very differently. Yes. So my question would be, given that software, and this is a question I've actually done some responding on and some writing about, so given that the software already exists, um, given that it already exists in the realm of copyright, and that it is eligible for copyright, does the case for uh, continuing software patents make as much sense? Well, this is not the only um, sort of situation where the, the realms of intellectual property cross over. There's also substantial crossover between trademark law and copyright. Um, in, in terms of like even just like a, a, a sculpture, you can copyright your sculpture and you can also get a design patent on it. Um, there are lots of places of crossover. I don't think the fact that there's room in copyrights for software removes software from the world of patents, um, or, or even makes a, a very strong case for it, because ultimately what they're protecting is two different things. Um, the, the copyright is, is there to protect against your very specific expression of this software, right? You're talking about, I am writing a, I'm writing a new thing, right? It's protected on a couple of different levels. There's the, the bare code, um, there's sort of the framework, and, and copywriting software is very complicated. I'm, I do not remember the whole structure of it off the top of my head. But basically, there are different levels of where you can get copyright protection for a piece of software. But patents is looking for something different. In the world of copyright, you're specifically protecting against copying. Somebody who saw what you did and said, okay, I'm going to do that same thing now. In the world of patents, it doesn't matter if they copied you or not. It's an absolute m monopoly. And what you get out of that is, is the know-how. The, that society gets out of that is the know-how of now we know exactly how to perform this piece of software. I don't know if that if that well I guess I guess I have a follow-up question then. Yeah. given that reverse in software unlike many other fields uh, reverse engineering is extremely common mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to know how something is made on the details of you don't need to know the step-by-step -step patent instructions that you put in software uh, it's this code with this data structure in order to replicate something on the back end Sure. So if the because what it's, so what you're t telling me in this case and you know we know this from patent trolls as well is that people you know if someone creates a photo sharing site and then someone else says oh I had this patent for a photo sharing site even if the code is working extremely differently mm -hmm. so the actual patentable steps are not the same and when a patent troll threatens to sue you don't really have the ability to know what they're suing on or taking a look at their patents either so let's get into patent troll discussions but the point is. It's not so much that having copyrights on software would va invalidate patents on software by the nature of what copyright and patents are, but in the nature of their intended effects of promoting innovation and competition in the marketplace. Do you think that copyright alone enough could do the job? Um, no. I mean, well, 
<laughs> that's my gut reaction. Uh, it's copyright is a very difficult to enforce thing. If you credit the idea that patents are beneficial to innovation, copyrights don't really provide that. Um, copyrights protect against copying. And that's really all they, you know, when you, when you have a copyright lawsuit, you have to prove that they actually copied it from you, right? And so that doesn't give you much in the way of protection. And so if, if, if you actually, if you, and I'm sure many of the people here do not, if you sign on to the idea that offering people patents makes them more willing to, to make new things, then just offering them a copyright is not really going to get them there because it doesn't give them the same way, the same ability to monetize that invention. Okay. Hi there. Uh, Hi. Uh, I'm sorry if you find this to maybe a silly question, but um, I've had this idea, um, which is I've heard, I don't even know if it's true, but uh, somebody might be able to tell me. Uh, W40, that product, that, that silicone product that you use, uh, well, to make things, uh, well, for whatever you use silicone for. If they uh, stick and they shouldn't stick? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, um, that, I've heard that actually that form, the formula isn't patented to, uh, the product itself isn't, doesn't actually have a patent. Right. And that is why actually it's a very well, uh, and nobody actually managed to copy the, their, their product. The, the, nothing is as good as it, apparently. Sure. So would, by analogy to the situation with software, would, would it, could, you, could you think of, a, any, of any situation in which it would be better not to seek for a patent for, on a product like that? Oh, absolutely. Um, that actually comes up quite a bit. Um, the, the realm of trade secret protection is pretty prominent in the law. Um, and a lot of places do choose to use it because trade secret protection doesn't end after 20 years. If you can keep that secret going forever, you have it forever. Um, trade secret protection, though, is like each of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. Trade secret protection can go forever, but you have to like be really careful. And it involves a lot of like it has to be a secret, and you have to like be able to show that you are putting forth legitimate effort towards making this a secret. And if you aren't keeping, you know, if, if, if you aren't making efforts to keep it a secret and somebody steals it, well, that's your own fault and the court's not going to give you anything for yeah, it. Basically the Coca-Cola formula. So right. I mean, the way Coca-Cola does it, they have that secret formula. They, I don't know, use, they have like three different, speculating. I've heard very, uh, there are various different places. They bring the different chemicals together. They mix them together so that nobody has the whole formula. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the level of effort that's required to keep a trade secret, these days especially. Um, so people get patents. And, and frankly, when you have a patent, like I was talking about earlier, it reduces transaction costs. Because once you have that patent, you can license the patent. You can sell the patent. Um, it, it just makes things kind of easier for you for those 20 years. Thank you so much. No problem. So you said this ruling uh, acknowledges that software patents as a concept are valid, but outlined certain ways in which uh, they can not be validly uh, put together. Did they outline any examples or concepts of what would be a valid software patent? Um, yeah, like the, the one that I kept coming back to was uh, the case of Diamond v. Deere uh, from the 1980s, which was about uh, a piece of software that was used to determine when to stop heating a piece of rubber when it was perfectly, perfectly cured. Um, and, you know, there have been a variety of other cases in the years since then, maybe n not necessarily getting up to the Supreme Court level, but at least, uh, uh, you know, at the federal circuit level, acknowledging software patents as being something that ex ex they exist and they're okay to have. Um, so I think that we have managed to reach a graceful dismount here. If there are no more questions, thank you all for coming.
Hello, Hope. Um, we've got some time yet until the next presentation, um, but before then, I just wanted to remind you all of what it was like to watch defrag happen on DOS. And you would see all the little blocks, and you would see the data moving from all the blocks to the empty spaces, and it would efficiently fill in the empty spaces. We want to try and do that with the seats. <laughs> so if, uh, if you're sitting near empty seats, and uh, it's possible for you to maybe move in and fill those and open up other strings of seats for everyone coming in, um, that would be very much appreciated. And uh, also, if you are coming in, look around for empty seats. Uh, don't be afraid to ask people to move out of the way so you can get to the empty seats. And uh, if, any, if any fights break out, uh, that's, that's your own problem. <laughs> OK, um, we've got a couple of minutes until the next presentation. But uh, until then, enjoy some more music. Hello again, Hope. Very, very good crowd here. OK, I've got a few brief announcements to make before we uh, get on to our next presentation. Um, the important one to know right now is that this place is full. Um, so if you can find an empty seat, take it. If you can uh, find some standing room and they're still letting you in, take it. But if you leave before the end of the presentation, you will not be let back in, because uh, we, we, just won't, we just won't want you here anymore. <laughs> um, a couple other things to uh, know about, so just uh, some general con stuff. If you want to stick stuff to the wall around the conference, there are lots of posters of all types around. Um, that's fine. We're uh, all for that. But do not use your own tape. Use our blue painter's tape. Um, if you go to our security desks or info desks, uh, they'll have some there, and they'll just give you some, because uh, that's, the t that's the kind of tape that we can use on these walls in uh, this hotel. So uh, yeah, take care of the walls, and uh, we can do this again next time. Um, speaking of taking care of things. Uh, Conferences have uh, what's called the 5-2-1 rule, if any of you are familiar with that. And if you're not, I'll explain what it is. It means every day of a conference, you should get five hours of sleep, two square meals, 
and one shower or a bath. <laughs> this is the way you take care of yourselves and those around you. So um, we're, we're, I think, uh, just about at capacity. So without much further ado, um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to present HTTP, HTTP Must Die with uh, Parker Higgins and Yang Zhu. Ladies and gentlemen. HTTP must die. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Parker, and this is Jan. Uh, <laughs> we work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm an activist there, and she's a technologist. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about uh, HTTPS and web encryption and uh, the, the many shortcomings of unencrypted web protocols. Um, so. Uh, Thank you for coming. And uh, I, if uh, did, could just quickly, does do people here know um, what the Electronic Frontier Foundation is? Where you work? Woo! Great. We can't actually see you, so it's okay. Don't raise your hands. I uh, so yeah, EFF. We do a lot of things around um, preserving people's privacy and uh, anonymity online, and so. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the things that we do in law and in activism and in code uh, to make people's online and technical experience uh, a little more private. All right, uh, so how many people here have ever felt insecure? Because you're lonely, you lost your job, you're not happy with yourself for some reason. Um, so I've never actually felt any of those things, but the other day, I was visiting Quora, Quora.com, which many people visit, um, and I noticed they're serving their login page over plain HTTP. And that's bad, because even if you're sending things over HTTPS, the attacker can modify the form and then uh, change the target to whatever they want. So in their case, it was even worse, because they were actually just sending usernames and passwords in plain HTTP. Shame on them. Um, and by the way, it's 2014. <laughs> this one out of fashion in like 2001. <laughs> and they're asking me to use Flash. You, right. Uh, so I mean, um, you guys are at Hope. I'm pretty sure most people here know why HTTP sucks. But to go over it again, there's no data confidentiality. So the person at the coffee shop or the person sitting next to you right now can read what you're sending over the wire. Uh, no data integrity, so they can tamper with it, and you can't detect anything. Uh, and there's no server authentication, so if you're visiting httpcora.com, it could be anything. Um, so could given all Quora. of this, what? Could be Quora. Could even be Quora. Oh my gosh. Uh, so given all of this, why are we still using HTTP? Okay, so people say HTTPS is hard. It's not actually true. But people might say certificate authorities are gross. Uh, they kill elephants. They are people we don't trust. Um, they can be corrupted by governments that say issue a certificate for something. Um, and we've seen evidence of this in the wild. So that's a real concern. Certificate authorities suck a lot. Uh, mixed content is bad. So if you're a news site and you're, you know, you've switched over to HTTPS, you're probably serving ads that don't support HTTPS. So you have to support HTTP, and then you have HTTP JavaScript on an HTTPS page, and then it's not, you know, not no security guarantees anymore. Um, and many advertisers don't yet support HTTPS, and that's why news organizations have been slow to transition to HTTPS by default. And if you're using a CDN, sometimes Alchemy, for instance, they can charge extra for HTTPS because they say, oh, you know, um, Windows XP doesn't support SNI, and so we need extra IP addresses, and so forth. And so because, and you, you know, if you have set up HTTPS, you have to remember to renew a cert. So I recently saw a statistic that something like, uh, like 40% of SSL certs in the wild were set to expire within a few months. Um, great, let's go on. So uh, let's start the talk with, uh, with part one. Why are we interested in HTTPS? Why do we start there? And I think the obvious answer is because we know they are interested in HTTP. 
Um, this slide uh, was, is, a, is a, a Snowden slide, of course. Uh, it's been in vogue for a year now to have slides that contain images of slides. And uh, we will not break from that trend. Uh, we know that the, that the NSA is interested in HTTP because they said that. Um, <laughs> HTTP, uh, it touches, you know, almost everything that users do. And, and, uh, and we saw this in the X key score leak. And more, uh, more particularly, we saw that they drill down to, uh, to search terms and news sites and, uh, here, here Glenn is quoted as saying, as one slide indicates, the ability to search HTTP activity by keyword permits the analyst access to what the NSA calls nearly everything a typical user does on the internet. So this matters a lot. Um, and it's important to note that HTTPS uh, and the commitment to HTTPS doesn't stop at the uh, lock on the user's browser. Um, you have to be encrypting the, the whole way. This, of course, is, uh, is from the, the muscular leak. Uh, I think most people will have seen the, the evil smiley by SSL added and removed here. Um, and that comes from a failure to be using uh, HTTPS or encryption uh, along the whole path, in this case, between data centers. And when you've got an agency with a footprint as large as the NSA, that, that actually matters. Uh, so how many of you have seen this article from The Intercept? So I know Michael Lee. Oh, quite a few. I can't really see anything, but I um, can kind of see some hands. So Michael Lee, who's in the audience, actually works on The Intercept, and I'm sure uh, can tell you all about it. But anyway, so they published this really this article that was really shocking to us uh, a few months ago that says NSA has these servers set up to implant, uh, potentially implant millions of devices with malware. That's pretty scary, and that's a lot of devices. So how does HTTP traffic enable this? Um, so here is a slide, within a slide, <laughs> from the NSA's quantum program. Um, so what you see here is a diagram of the target, which could be you know, me or you or Parker or anyone here, logging into their Yahoo Mail account, because maybe it's like 2008, uh, and you were still using Yahoo Mail. Um, and uh, so they log in, and Yahoo Mail, maybe at that time, isn't HTTPS by default, even though it does a 302 redirect or something. Um, so um, the NSA server, or um, yeah, the NSA server can see that they're going to Yahoo. Um, and they uh, this sends a signal to what's called a Fox Asset server. And the Fox Asset server does the work of sending back malicious packets to the user's devices uh, f for uh, like spoofed to look like Yahoo packets. Um, so in essence, um, by putting these uh, these like packet ejection servers at um, strategic geographic locations, um, they can exploit this race condition and get to the target's computer before the real Yahoo packets. Um, and this uh, this uh, packet injection will like exploit some sort of vulnerability in browsers and um, and implant the malware. And this is quite scary. So you might be asking, so uh, millions of computers, you know, maybe they're doing sort of targeting, you know, like targeting people that they think are suspicious. So what would they be using for targeting? And it turns out they're using things like cookies, like Google cookies, Yahoo cookies, et cetera. Um, because many services like Google, even if they're using HTTPS by default, uh, they're leaking your identity all over uh, because they have not secured cookies. So um, if you don't set the secure flag on a cookie, as many of you know, um, another, uh, another, a man in the middle can say, I am Google.com, send me all the cookies for Google.com. And they'll read all your Google cookies, which are really unique. And they can even set cookies for you. They can say, um, set this cookie for this uh, target so I can look at them later. So cookies are being used as selectors in this case, plain HTTP cookies. Um, we also, uh, they also use some browser selector. We don't know what code name Silly Bunny is, but we've chosen to illustrate it with a Silly yeah, Bunny. Yeah, so we asked, we asked some lawyers and like no one knew what Silly Bunny was. If anyone knows what Silly Bunny is, please tell us. Uh, we'd really like to know. <laughs> right, so, so, let's, so let's reiterate that. So unencrypted cookies, we used to think cookies are bad because advertisers use them to track us around the web. Now we know they're also bad because they're used as weapons for NSA to decide who to target with malware. Um, so 
we, we know that there's a, uh, a privacy reason and a security reason, but there's also another really important reason to be using uh, HTTPS, and it's maybe one that doesn't get as much attention, and it has to do with censorship. So when we talk about something like the, the Great Firewall of China, there's a number of ways in which it works, but one of the ways it works is by doing uh, keyword filtering, by uh, drilling down on the contents of a particular web page or of a page within a site. So you know you can access a newspaper, but not necessarily the offending article. Um, and the way that HTTPS addresses this is that uh, when you uh, when you make an HTTPS connection, only the host is uh, is is available in the in the clear. Um, so if you're looking at an article, for example, on the Intercept here. Uh, a, a man in the middle can know that you're looking at something on first look, uh, but they don't necessarily know which uh, which part of first look or even which which article. And there's a there's a big asterisk next to that. So this is this is true for uh, for all sorts of sites. A, a big example is Wikipedia. Of course, uh, it means something different to be looking at Wikipedia than to be looking at an article on you know something in particular uh, or inflammatory. But the big asterisk there is that. That uh, is still vulnerable to uh, things like metadata analysis. So, if each article has a distinct file size, uh, then you can you can get around this by just measuring the size of the files that are being transferred, and you can know which article people are looking at. Um, there are ways of avoiding that. You can do padding, um, but that has pros and cons. Uh, the important part here is that this kind of uh, that HTTPS makes that kind of attack much more sophisticated and expensive. And so, even if it's not perfect, uh, it, it does a good job of of um, protecting privacy. But the censorship angle here is that. Uh, it forces somebody who wants to block certain keywords to make the decision to block an entire site or not. And we've actually seen this play out. So uh, last year, GitHub was, for a little while, blocked in China. The entirety of GitHub, because it's HTTPS, was blocked because there were um, the, the, the leading belief is that there were a handful of repositories that had something offensive. And so the, the only solution, because you can't block those repositories, is to block the in, entire site. And of course, the Chinese developer community was not very happy about this, and they were very vocal, and they said uh, that, that you know we can't do our work. And so uh, there was a backlash, and that backlash forced uh, forced the, the hands of the Chinese censors to say, okay, we'll, we'll let the whole thing go, including uh, including these repositories we don't like. And there's a there's a quote from a prominent Chinese developer who said he compared the blocking of GitHub to trying to catch a mouse by burning the entire house down. Forcing that decision is a good position to be in, to, to release the mice into the house and say, well, your only option is to burn the whole house down. And that, that puts the blame really squarely where it belongs on the censors. So that's, uh, that's a, a, an important story with a, with a good conclusion. Um, there's one that didn't end as well, uh, which, is, uh, which is the story of Google Reader. Uh, similarly, Google Reader was, was at a you know, path. It wasn't a subdomain. So it was google.com slash reader. And so countries had to choose whether they were going to block all of Google services or allow Reader. And of course, Reader could make connections to other sites. And so people in Iran were able to read the news from around the world uh, by accessing it through Reader. And it made the, the censors decide, do we want to block everything Google? And for the most part, they didn't. They, uh, there, were, there was you know, one or two weeks where they did that. But for the most part, Reader was a way to access this news. And this is really important. In Iran, there's estimates that one in three news sites are blocked. So this was an easy way for people to get around that censorship. And you know, now it's gone. Uh, so here's a quote that I really like from our friend Nicholas Weaver, uh, who I think sums this up really well. The only self-defense from all of these things above is universal encryption, which is difficult, expen uh, difficult and expensive, but unfortunately necessary. Um, so, and, and we know why it's necessary. There's another great advantage. If you run a news site and you uh, turn on HTTPS, uh, the ACLU's Chris Segoyan has offered a bottle of whiskey to any admin uh, at a news org that switches websites to HTTPS by default. So not only are you defending your reader's privacy and security, but also you can get a drink off Chris uh, off of it. So. I think Chris might be here right now, by the way. So you could even get it from him. Let's bankrupt him. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's go nuts.
<laughs> okay, so this talk was actually meant to be uh, a really, a really optimistic, happy one, and I think it's going to end up being that way. But I, I think uh, because it's, it's nice to be cautious, part two is called Not Everything Sucks Sometimes Probably. Yeah, and we'll see why not everything sucks sometimes, probably. And um, So one way that we look at this, uh, at the way that things don't suck, is uh, through the Encrypt the Web report. And this is, it's, it's just a sampling, it's, you know, we look at a handful of websites, services that people use, and, uh, and we measure how, uh, how those sites are doing in, in terms of encrypting user data. And so uh, you can see the first category is, um, this is just, by the way, this is a long chart that I've just split up into two. Um, encrypts data center links, uh, which we saw is matters because of the muscular attack. Supports HTTPS, and then the next two categories are how well are, are they doing HTTPS. Um, and then the last one is start TLS for encrypting uh, user emails in transit, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And really the exciting thing here is that uh, we started with a lot of a lot of uh, gray and red, and it's gotten over the the last. We've been running it for about six or seven months. Uh, it's gotten a lot more green. We've gotten a bunch of sites that have started uh, rolling out HTTPS and doing it well in perfect forward secrecy. And these things, you know, in response to the news cycle, in response to someone uh, pushing on them and saying, you know, your your users deserve better. Um, one major example of this was Facebook in, uh, you probably can't see the date, but it's July 2013, so this is the month after the Snowden revelation started, switched on HTTPS by default. It was, uh, most users had it before, but it's by default, and this is a huge amount of connections uh, that are now encrypted. Um, uh, we saw Google made an adjustment, um, and HTTPS protects not just the contents of the page, but also if you go from an HTTPS site to an HTTP site, there's an extra measure of privacy added by uh, your browser will blank out the referrers. So the, in Search Engine Watch, they're just upset that they stopped getting uh, keyword data. But for users, that's actually an extra level of privacy. Oh, by the way, the timestamp on this is September 2013? Yeah, September 2013. Wow, so thank you, Snowden. Yeah, <laughs> the Snowden <laughs> effect. Uh, so um, so it's not just web browsing. So there's also email. And uh, email, SMTP, can optionally use uh, an encryption um, protocol called Start TLS, which is opportunistic, um, which means like a server can advertise, I support encryption. Um, and then um, the other side will upgrade to uh, TLS, but it's unauthenticated, and a man in the middle can downgrade by saying the side doesn't support TLS, and it'll just fall back to um, plain text because you really want your mail to be delivered, usually. Um, so uh, my colleague Peter made this awesome, although somewhat confusing looking chart from, um, from Google's data. So I don't actually know why there's this like periodicity um, but um, but on the whole, it looks like Start TLS usage is uh, is rising pretty well. So since December 2013, which is when this chart starts, um, there's been a 33 to 58 percent increase, and that's really uh, really great. Um, and this has been uh, similar statistics have been shown by Facebook's data. So you know, if you run a mail server, you can actually do an analysis like this yourself because you can look at the percentage of inbound and outbound um, connections that are using Start TLS. And if you find out, you should send it to EFF because this data is really hard to get. Like we can't just scan the web and like see um, like what mail servers are using That's inbound and outbound they Start do. TLS. <laughs> yeah. So it was really nice to get this data released by Google and Facebook, and we always like to hear more. Um, so after all of this, there was this report uh, recently from uh, from Wired, well, reported on Wired, that said encrypted web traffic more than doubles after NSA revelations. That's pretty dramatic. Um, but what did I actually mean by that? Next slide. Um, so if you read the report, it says that between uh, pre-Snowden and uh, after Snowden, the percentage of overall web traffic in each of these continents that is encrypted has gone from 2.29 to 3.8 percent in North America, which is pretty good. In Europe, it's gone from about 1.5 to 6 percent. But in Latin America, it's gone from 1.8 to 10.37 percent just in one year. That is, yeah, like that deserves applause. Yeah. I would, I would applaud for that. Um, 
Um, and a lot of that is due to large service providers like Google and Facebook um, doing their part and starting to encrypt things by default. Um, but that is super, super significant. Um, so part three, what is next? Um, We've been doing really well, but you know, there's always things we can be doing better. And part three is supposed to be about, um, you know, so you're, you're at hope. You're probably going to go to a lot of talks that are really pessimistic, like like whistleblowers are all going to die soon. That's what hope's all about, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, they I put hope in the name because it's not in any of the talks. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I so this is day one, um, and it's it's nice to start on kind of a high note. So um, part right. So so whatever you hear in the rest of hope, remember that Cloudflare is pledging the double SSL usage on the web in 2014. Um, Cloudflare, I believe, is getting uh, is man in the middling about um, five percent of web traffic right now. So doubling that is going to be really really important. And moreover, if Cloudflare does this, perhaps we can get Alchemy to do the same and say, Alchemy, you've been using your like excuses long enough. Look, Cloudflare is offering SSL to everyone, even free customers. Um, why aren't you going to do the same? And once we get CDNs on board, um, that will be really awesome. Okay, uh, and then there's the browsers. So um, you know, there's this chart that I really like uh, about browsers <laughs> and what they're what they're like uh, yeah uh, sorry if you're in the back it's very funny <laughs> yeah I'm sorry if you can't read it <laughs> but it's really funny we'll tell you each individually <laughs> after just come up after if you ask a question yeah, about go up what and we'll says, explain what the, we'll what the explain question what is the <laughs> I'm sorry this is so small <laughs> I didn't realize this was gonna be a large room yeah but um, so, how many of you know know about HSTS? Yeah, right. some fans, uh, I guess. I can't really see. Uh, <laughs> but HSTS it, uh, prevents against this attack called SSL strip, right? So usually you go to a website by typing in uh, gmail.com, and your by, your browser by default goes unless you're using HTTPS everywhere, which is this awesome browser extension. Um, but usually your browser will go to httpgmail.com. And if someone's um, actively monitoring your connection, they can take that and redirect it to a fake site, and you won't notice that the lock icon is missing, perhaps. So HSTS is a header that the server sends to the client that says, I only want you to contact me over HTTPS for the next several months, or however long the server wants you to do that. Um, and so that prevents against this SSL stripping attack, right? Um, and it's been around for a few years. Um, Chrome and Firefox have supported it. Safari, Safari also has for a while. Um, and now, IE, after uh, EFF asked them, uh, Microsoft has said that they're, they're going to support HSTS in the next release of Internet Explorer. Browsers. Yay, browsers. <laughs> browsers. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, and uh, and also uh, we've seen large companies like Yahoo say pretty awesome things, like pretty large promises. And it's up to everyone here to remember that people like people like Yahoo have said this and hold them to it because this is how we get things done, right? So they've said that traffic moving between Yahoo data centers is going to be fully encrypted as of well. Okay, so that's in the past. It's already fully encrypted. Um, they made Yahoo Mail more secure, HTTPS by default. Um, search queries will also have HTTPS by default. Um, and uh, uh, at the last one is kind of interesting. It says there will be a new encrypted version of Yahoo Messenger um, that will be deployed in the coming months. So great. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about an initiative that we worked on in this. This is actually uh, the the members of, of a coalition that, that worked on a, a campaign called Reset the Net. As you can see, it's a, it was a pretty large and diverse coalition. Um, and Reset the Net launched on June 5th, 2014. It was the one-year anniversary of the, of the Snowden leaks. Um, 
and uh, it really showed how far we've come in that year. And it's, a, it's an ongoing campaign to try to uh, increase the, the security across these major platforms. Um, many of the sites listed here made improvements. Uh, perhaps one of the most exciting was um, WordPress.com announced that uh, they, by the end of this year, they will serve pages only over SSL for all uh, WordPress.com subdomains, and so that's that's you know a lot of blogs. As you can, this is our um, our attempt at an SSL added here, smiley face. Uh, <laughs> so and, you know WordPress powers uh, between .com and .org powers 15 percent of the web. So this is a this is a really major thing, um, and and we're seeing this and we're seeing it more and more. Uh, and and of course there are some other exciting things that don't have that aren't easily illustrated. Uh, yeah. So to be honest, I made most of these slides at 4 a.m. this morning, um, and I just don't have time to like find pictures. Though I'm sure some can exist. Um, so uh, so this is kind of a slide about what's new in SSL land, other than people deploying it. Like how is SSL inherently going to get better? Um, so people yell a lot about SSL. They say that, you know, you can't trust certificate authorities, right? Like if NSA can go to DigiCert and say, issue a cert, issue me a cert for Google, um, then it's game over, right? They can decrypt all the traffic, et cetera. So how are we going to prevent things like that? Um, it's not impossible, it turns out. So there's a new proposal called certificate transparency that will basically make every certificate issued by a CA um, have to be added to a log uh, that is uh, maintained by Google and other organizations, like possibly EFF will run on one of these logs. And for the browser to accept the cert, it has to accept, it has to, um, the server has to show proof that the cert has made it into one of these logs. And it uses like a cool data structure called a Merkle tree that makes this lookup process very efficient. Yes, people really like Merkle trees. I heard someone <laughs> really, really get excited at that. Um, <laughs> So, so you know, what certificate transparency at the end of the day, what it means is that if a CA issues a bad certificate, um, we can either see, either we can see it or uh, in the certificate log, or the client won't accept it, and that's really really nice. Um, and Google is actually like you might say, oh, this is like some theoretical math thing. It's like not going to be used anytime soon. Um, Google is actually planning to require. Um, certificate transparency for all extended validation certs by the end of the year, if I remember correctly. Um, I'm not sure if that timeline has changed, but I think that's what they said a few months ago. And then there's HTTP public key pinning, which solves the problem that um, anyone can issue a cert for EFF dot or any CA can issue a cert for a site like EFF dot org. And HTTP public key pinning lets EFF say, I only want the cert from uh, start SSL, and this is the cert that you should expect to see every time you connect to EFF.org. And that will make it harder for people to create fake certificates for EFF or Google and so forth. Um, HTTP public key pinning is, um, is, I think you can already do it statically through a preloaded list in Chrome, and soon you'll be able to do it dynamically by sending a header like HSTS. Um, and on the mail, on the uh, mail encryption side, EFF has just launched a project called Start TLS Everywhere. Uh, some of the creators of that are in the audience. Um, you can't see them though because it's really dark. But Start TLS Everywhere um, so tries to solve the problem of downgrade attacks on SMTP servers. Um, the problem is SMTP servers don't know each other's TLS policies. So if you say um, like mx.gmail.com doesn't support TLS. Uh, be, like if you say that from a man in the middle, then the other server has no way of knowing that's a man in the middle. So start TLS uses these configuration files to enforce TLS policies between SMTP servers. Um, and we'll, we'll be giving more talks on that in the future, so I won't, won't tell you everything about it right now. Uh, no spoilers. Some, yeah, no spoilers. Uh, and um, so I heard earlier, earlier someone at Hope said, like I just overheard someone say, oh, like, you know, like sysadmins aren't, never all going to deploy TLS by default. It needs to just be enforced. Like the default just needs to be encryption. We can't make people have to like buy cert and set it up and all this work. So HTTP 2.0 has a proposal to address that called opportunistic encryption, which will make all uh, HTTP traffic encrypted by default 
But then you might say, oh, like, what about CAs? Like, how do we get authentication? Um, and the answer is, like, opportunistic um, encryption might just mean unauthenticated encryption, um, which means, of course, that, like, NSA can just pretend to be any server and, like, do, do uh, like, an attack or a downgrade attack. So real TLS, is, real HTTPS is still better, but opportunistic encryption is on the table for HTTP 2.0. All right, so, uh, sorry, we, we put these comics up and then you have to read it and I didn't say anything funny. Um, so uh, I hope that we, uh, we effectively made the point today that um, HTTP is, uh, is horribly insecure and that uh, if you're running a website, it's not, uh, it's not optional. It's, it's for, your, for your readers and users. Uh, privacy and security and for your site to be accessible and to, to preserve the integrity. HTTPS is something that you should absolutely be uh, looking into and deploying. Um, you, you know, as we like to say, uh, if it's it's too important to, to leave up to an unencrypted protocol. So if, if you like it, you should put an S on it. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> Jan dared me to do that one. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and we uh, thank you very much, and we'd like to open the floor to questions. Yeah, I'm sorry this talk was too short. We didn't really time it, so it's just half an hour. You can get a snack or something. But we we can also take questions for a bit. People have those. Whoa! Wow, hey, most of you are still here. here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No. I can't hear you. You can, can we get the um, the question mic on? Uh, if you yell it at me, I will repeat it. Okay, so speaking as one of the authors of HTTP. <laughs> I'll repeat at the end. <laughs> it's not the people's mic here. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to repeat as much of that as I can. Uh, we inadvertently threatened to kill this man's baby. Uh, uh, I, I actually we didn't threaten. We just said it has to die. It wasn't. Uh, and and the the problem uh, per the per the question or the statement is better addressed at the CDN level and most importantly. Uh, that the CDNs need to hear demand from pe from their customers, which are you know likely uh, include people in this room, uh, that they want to turn on encryption uh, you know across the network. Is that? Yeah. And uh, and so I agree at least with the conclusion and probably with most of it, right? Yeah. Um, that uh, we ought to uh, we ought to be demanding this. That's how we get we get companies to to start doing those changes. Um, could you talk a bit about Dane? because you didn't list Dane in your promising. Uh, do you know what it is? Yes. OK. Uh, I think uh, we can talk more about that afterward. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think that there is a lot of, um, so I'm not an expert on DNSSEC, but we've heard a lot of people say that it's infeasible for them to deploy at the moment. 
um, which was part of why we um, we started the TL, Start TLS Everywhere project. Okay, but the okay. argument that the CDNs have for not being able to manage their certificates, if they could use self-signed certificates in their own DNS zone data, then that would circumvent that problem completely. And moreover, it would circumvent the problem with the crappy, you know, everywhere trusted CAs in every government in the world that you don't want to be able to issue your certs. So it would actually eliminate a lot of the pinning and transparency problems if Dane were widely adopted. So I urge you to follow the Dane um, uh, efforts because I think they're going to be very promising. Yeah, there are a number of, uh, Dane is, is one of them, there are a number of, of efforts uh, that uh, have at varying degrees of, of technical completion um, that uh, have yet to be adopted. Um, and yeah, the, many of them are really interesting. Uh, a little bit of, of what we're talking about is what we have now. And uh, I, you know, we could, we could easily double the number of um, HTTPS. I mean, Cloudflare's talking about doubling it just with a switch on their end. And that would, uh, that does a lot of, on the ground already. Huh. Ah. I guess. Oh. Is there any truth to the rumor that the uh, EFF is going to fight untrustworthy CAs by becoming a trustworthy CA? Uh, that's a great question. I think we don't comment on rumors and speculation. I don't think we comment I... on that one. <laughs> well, think about it. But yeah, thank, thank you for asking. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Richard Barnes, and I do security stuff with Mozilla. Um, Thank you. Which is relevant, because I, I have uh, some bad news and some good news. Um, the, the bad news is that if Cloudflare is saying they're going to double the, the percentage of SSL on the internet, they're lying, because it's impossible. Um, and I say it's impossible. The good news is that it's impossible, because I, I was just checking the stats from our, our telemetry, uh, and we're seeing like 60% of the web being encrypted right now. So I think that's... Yeah, largely due to a lot of the efforts of the folks in this room, and so I wanted to applaud that part of it. Um, say, say again? You are counting differently from the way they are. Pop, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. I say, I, I, I'm having fun with metrics here. I say let's let them try. <laughs> let's take them oh, yeah, 120 percent encryption, and we're happy. <laughs> we're happy. That's all we ask for. Yeah. That's so, all. We're, we're simple. So one of the things that was on your slides that's in active flux right now, really active discussion right now, is this idea of opportunistic encryption yes. in HTTP2. And I, I'm one of the, the instigators of that in the, in the HTTP BIS working group. Um, so if people could take a look at that, that's something where we have community discussions. It's in the IETF. There's a working group around this right now that's discussing it. So if people have a feelings about whether we should allow opportunistic encryption, whether we should require browsers to validate certs in HTTP2, mm -hmm. that would be something where community feedback would be really helpful. Uh, I also think this mail encryption that you guys are getting involved in is, is really good. The, the web is sort of on a really positive path, and there's good momentum. The mail community, they're much more fractured. They don't really know how to do authentication. So whatever you guys can do to help move them forward would be really helpful. Cool, thanks. Uh, out of curiosity, do you, do you want to offer your opinion on opportunistic encryption? So the, those of us who have been sort of our internal security mafia at Mozilla have been talking a lot about this. Um, yeah. You know, we are, uh, obviously, HTTPS is the gold standard, as you guys said. Um, it's, it provides all of, it blocks a, a whole nother, well, it is a standard. Um, Some color. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it blocks a lot of attacks that we know happen, as you put on your slide. Um, we've been really supportive of opportunistic encryption. We we're, were, um, in the IETF process, we've been putting forward proposals to, enable enc uh, encryption with the, with the possibility of discovering when, um, you know, with the possibility for, a lot of, as you said, unauthenticated. So um, spin up your Apache instance, have a gen genuine up a self-signed certificate, don't bother going out to, see, to, to a CA if you don't want to. Um, and we'll go ahead and do the encryption. And, you know, we're not, we might not display a lock icon or anything because it's, you're still vulnerable to all this stuff because it's not HTTPS. But, we may uh, go ahead and accept that cert and do the encrypted connection, uh, even if it's um, even if it's not a cert from a CA that validates an identity. Um, and I, I don't want this to turn into it's a Mozilla question hour. Um, so I I can't speak off the top of my head to the development plans in terms of what we're planning to implement. 
but in the IETF and the standards discussions, we've been trying to find ways that we can agree on uh, to, to expand the set of website operators who can do encryption. Thank you. And I, I, I encourage people to take part in those discussions because they're interesting and I think it's a, it, there are some hard questions and, raised. And there's lots of different valid perspectives. So if, I mean, the, the more mass we can have behind different perspectives, the more we can understand how much the community feels one way or the other. Thank you. Um. So after Heartbleed, OpenSSL was a media darling for a little while and got some security reviews. Um, and like a couple more flaws have, float, have floated around. But in general, it's maybe in a better, one could argue that it's in a better place. However, there's also forks of it now, like Libra SSL and Google has their own deployment strategy for SSL now. Boring guys, SSL. Yep, what do you guys make of that? Probably good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to have some diversity out there. Uh, it's also nice to have, I think, uh, if, if you don't have diversity, it's nice to have a lot of effort in one place. And uh, what uh, what the, the media reports after Heartbleed showed is that we had neither. We had one solution that had you know one and a half people working on it. Um, two, sorry, two and a half. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, I, I think that if, if what we get is more attention on OpenSSL or if, or if what we get is a, a number of, of really good solutions, then either way is, is, is better off. And you know, it's, it's easy to, Heartbleed was, uh, it was a rough week. Um, I work at Red Hat, it was a rough <laughs> week. <laughs> oh, uh, it you. sucked. <laughs> but but I, I think uh, it's, you, you know, we were able to recover and we at least have some sort of infrastructure in place for communicating that this happens and it came, I mean, there it could have been worse and I think that there are things that, steps we took after that that, that will make it more likely to be better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, one, thing, all right, one thing I've been thinking of, and this is something I've actually been thinking of for a while in regards to dealing with the problems of both CAs and DNS, is I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Namecoin project, but the possibility of using multiple Namecoin server, basically multiple Tor in services, as essentially Namecoin blockchain CAs, connecting to them through Tor and then using something similar to Moxie Marlin Spike's convergence as a means of validating the entries when you receive them, and then just transfer everything over to that rather than going through standard CAs and DNS. Yeah. And it's so simple. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, so there, uh, I've, I've seen a um, uh, number of proposals like that, usually involving some sort of like cryptographically verified append-only log like a blockchain. Um, but I think uh, if, if I think we've yet to see something that's really complete along those lines, um, and if that comes along, I think it'd be interesting to think about. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'd love if something like really weird happened. Like, it, I, you know, that's that's not even that that's pretty weird. But like, yeah, let's try a bunch of stuff and and see. You know, like, I it it could happen. And and uh, there's been a lot of stories about the development of the web where it wasn't, you know, it was pretty weird along the way. Just remember, science isn't about why, it's about why not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Thanks for the talk, guys. Um, question, so SSL, yay. Buying an EV cert for 500 bucks, not yay. Not as um, so I do some work with like nonprofits and NG in NGOs. $500, you know, is trivial to a large corporation, but to some of these smaller orgs, that's that's serious money. Or you know, some you know activist blogger in Nepal. Are there any CAs that offer you know free <laughs> certs, or would such a thing be feasible? Yes. Uh, so it depends. So if you're use if you just have like a single page website, or I think just like a single domain website, and you don't need like arbitrary subdomain coverage for SSL, uh, start Startcom will give you a free certificate. And uh, but not EV, right? Not EV. That's correct. Uh, and uh, so Cloudflare has stated that they are planning to offer SSL to free customers to in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's a really important point, though, is that uh, this is this is really important, and that's a good reason to tr to try to make it to to make these prices come down. And then that's that's a, a little bit of pressure, and and you know hopefully 
cloud flare switching it on it applies more pressure but yeah it, that's obviously a burden and there's, there's things that not just the cost um, if you're an activist blogger in Nepal uh, it, it very well the complexity of, of deploying it might be a, a showstopper and so you know there's a lot of places to work on making this easier thank you all right I think that's all the questions thank you very much yeah, thank you all this is great
Hello, Hope. Okay, um, just a few brief announcements before we move on to our next presentation. Um, one of them is if you uh, want to hang stuff up around the conference, um, we're all for that. We love that. But um, be sure to use the blue painter's tape. Don't use any other kind of tape, no matter how much you may want to. Um, if you need some painter's tape, go to our info desk or, or uh, security desk, and they'll have some, and they'll just give it to you because they like you that much. But uh, don't use any other tape than the blue painter's tape to stick anything to this hotel's walls. Um, beyond that, uh, I think uh, I think we're about ready. If uh, these rooms have been filling up, so be advised that throughout the conference, if uh, if a talk fills up and you leave before the end of the talk, you probably won't be able to get back in because uh, you've lost your you've lost your place. Um, all right, so without, uh, without further ado, it's uh, my pleasure to present the Internet Society Speaks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Pesner and David Solomonoff. Thank you, thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, 
extremely bright lights. Uh, so, not that I can see any of you, but I'd like to take a quick poll before we begin. How many of you would say that you are involved in internet governance issues? All right, I can see briefly like two or three hands. How many of you have um, called your congressman or so got, otherwise gotten involved in the net neutrality debates? Yeah. All right, I got news for you. You're involved in internet governance. And as we, get through, as we go through this presentation, you're going to see why. But for right now, let's get started with the history of internet governance. We're going to go all the way from the very beginning, all the way to the possible and zany futures. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about how the internet actually began. This began in the mind of J.C.R. Licklider when he envisioned the intergalactic network that was going to link all the computers in the world together, of which there were maybe on the order of 10 to 20. <laughs> so you can imagine, why would we need to link these things together? And you know, these days it sounds like a foregone conclusion, but think about what computers were like then. These were giant information processing machines. You fed data into them, and you got data back out of them. You know, there was no questions of using them to learn, th to uh, really research things, or to um, find novel discussion, you know, find novel discoveries beyond what you were already doing with your data. They were just giant, room-sized, bulky items. And now this guy wanted to link them together for some reason. Now, J.C.R. Licklider only had a small two-year tenure at ARPA, where he was, uh, but he wasn't able to get it off the ground at that point. So his Ro Robert Taylor, his protege, was the one who actually did it. And Leonard Kleinrock at UCLA hosted one of the first nodes. Kleinrock was found a, had published research in the packet switching technique that we all lo know and love today. And his grad students, Vince Cerf, Steve Crocker, and John Postel, ended up forming something called the Network Working Group to elicit and to discuss new ideas for this emerging ARPA network. And they sought requests for comments, or RFC, on ARPANET's development. Now, the cool thing about the network working group was that anyone could participate. Of course, when we're talking about a network of four nodes, that's not really a whole lot of people. But the good news is that as we got more nodes, we got more people. And since the object of the group was to talk about the network, it was sort of a self-propagating and beneficial feedback loop. People, anybody who wanted to get involved was really able to, and there was no question of exclusion or backlash as long as you were able to play nice with other people. And because people were collaborating and working together, they were able to develop a lot of uh, <clears throat> foundational protocols and software that are foundation to the internet today, such as email. That was a combination of the already existing FTP protocol plus some messaging systems uh, customized for different nodes in the network. So, as the ARPANET continued to develop, people realized that this packet switching network thing was actually a pretty cool idea. And they started, others started to prop it up. We had the Aloha Net, and in the 80s, the NSF Net, and a few other networks. BBN was trying to establish its own network. I think IBM was as well. So before we know it, we had dozens of, or maybe not dozens, but a whole bunch of different packet switching networks. The problem is they all work differently. The ARPANET had these interface messaging protocols that sort of governed how traffic was directed, but others worked differently. And it was just, these were all kind of on their own networks. These were railroads with no interconnection. And so Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn developed the Transmission Control Protocol, and literally they called it Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol, the idea being that they could use this protocol to internetwork the networks. It didn't matter what kind of data you were sending. TCP IP was just focused on getting the data from one place to the other. Then the networks could do with it as they wanted to. They could insert their own protocols closer to the endpoints. What was cool about the TCP IP protocol is that it was open source, or what we know today as open source, because they just shot it out to the network working group and said, here, look at this thing. What do you think of it? And then they were able to take it and improve upon it and eventually implement it on the emerging popular Unix system in the late, not in the late 80s. This is how Sun computers became very popular, because you could include TCP IP at no extra cost. Again, seems a given today, but at that point it was most definitely not. So now we get to network privatization. As I said, there were all these different networks, and so TCP/IP kind of made it as a um, kind of you know glued all these things together, but it was a rickety operation at best. And not only that, these networks were used primarily for academic or extremely geeky purposes. Uh, the idea of the average user having anything to do with the internet was still uh, nowhere on the table. But then a little something called the World Wide Web came around, and people started to take notice. Suddenly, there was human-readable text 
yet you could change the fonts and style of this was amazing. Uh, the ideas of having graphics, graphical user interfaces for the web, you know, this was, this was big stuff in the late 80s and early 90s. And so people started to realize, hey, maybe this network, this internet could actually be useful for uh, the general public, people like you and me. And so expansion started to, they wanted to expand it, but the internet, but the internet and its relevant smaller networks were being run by academic institutions and the NSF and other organizations that really had no business in trying to service a network for the general public. So they saw privatization as the means to go, uh, as the way to go. Telecoms like AT&T, we could suddenly take this over and add, you know, this new internet to their already existing copper telephone lines. And this is how we had our little fun known as dial-up. So, so that's how the network started to become accessible to the average person in the early 90s. But there was another aspect to this, and this is where the whole governance thing starts to come in. Uh, we may, you know, you know for, as you know, the internet's inventor, Al Gore, uh, became vice president in the uh, early 90s and he had been working on technology issues for a couple of decades prior and once he was in the vice presidency he was really able to make this a central component of the administration and he, um, <clears throat> he came up with this term though the information superhighway is the one that stuck but for policy purposes this was all referred to as the national information infrastructure this emerging technological network that was going to better the lives of everyone around them so they set up some information infrastructure task forces to discuss some of these technology policy issues that they could foresee arising as this internet became common. Now for those of you who are curious about the 1996 Telecom Act, too bad. This is uh, occurring in a different sort of space than what I'm about to talk about and was really more centered at the FCC. I'm about to talk about stuff that was more focused at the White House and Department of Commerce. So, but before I get to that, um, one thing I want to mention is that this was not simply an American initiative. A lot of this was happening in the American White House, but they recognized that this was going to be a global phenomenon. So, so many of the people involved were not only just working here, but they were going to meetings abroad. They were trying to talk about how can we connect to users abroad, users in Europe, users in Asia, users in Africa. These were questions even then, even before the internet was uh, as prevalent, anywhere near as prevalent as it is today. and. They strove for, you know, generally uh, admirable goals, universal access and open competition, and different uh, settings that could make the internet easily usable and accessible by anyone. Now, e-commerce was actually a pretty big topic that got a lot of attention, particularly when we're talking about international commerce. Now, buying stuff on the web, oh, big deal today, right? But, of course, it, we're talking about a network that in the late 80s was used strictly for research purposes and in fact was forbidden from having any commercial content posted to it. Think about that. Think about trying to talk about e-commerce on a network with that kind of history. And not only that, try to, talk, try to think about e-commerce between nations which have vastly different tax laws different, and different other sorts of uh, regulations when we're talking about trying to buy and sell things. This is huge and security, mobile payment, I mean we're talking about big we're talking about issues that people are still grappling with today at a time before the internet was in everyone's homes so but it was a good thing to be able to put on the internet as people uh started using it because people want to buy things and so um, so lots of people were had their different opinions on it but the, it really started to make headway when clinton the clinton administration set up its own little interagency uh group among the different government agencies to talk about this uh but they really couldn't ever figure out a governance solution, and I haven't done much research on the modern uh, issues of e-commerce, but I think they're still trying to figure it out. So now we have to talk to the question, get back to the question of who was actually at the table for these things. There are all these committees and all these discussions, that gr that's great, but as I was mentioning, so far it was really mostly from the government. And so the Department of Commerce established committees for several key issues, apart from the ones I already mentioned, including intellectual property and online privacy and government information. Those, those uh, committees each published very key reports. And, um, but the reports had different levels of effects. The privacy paper was really sort of, I talk about loose, like, well, you know, you should, if you're a company using personal information, you should probably tell your users what they're using it for. Simple, right? And 
But the IP uh, Intellectual Property Committee was a whole different story. They published very strict and specific recommendations in favor of copyright holders. Their logic was, well, the Internet is here, but we've got to fill it with content. And unless content providers are confident that their content is secure, they won't be putting their content onto the Internet. It seems kind of logical, but then they kind of missed the step where users generate content themselves. And this whole new type of idea of information sharing that has uh, arisen since then. So there was a lot of internet outrage and, and coordination, even in the 90s, around uh, issues like these. There was uh, particularly around universities and libraries and other types of uh, digital, digital uh, eggheads who kind of saw these, in, these IP laws as, as threatening to them. They really uh, were concerned that if these recommendations worded as specifically as they were were put into place, you know, all of a sudden the internet might you know, turn into a place that was a little less desirable for them to be, for them to be working. And uh, this is without the benefit of hindsight that we have today. Um, there, were other, there, was other, um, uh, there was another organization called the Advisory Council, separate from the committees that I just talked about. Now, this was interesting because these were compri this was comprised of people from outside government. Everything else I was talking about to this point was made up of people already inside government, a federal government. But this council included people from education, included people from uh, universities, from research, from telecom companies, from technology, from big media, et cetera, et cetera. So we were talking about a, a council that was at 1.37 people strong from all these different areas. Now, you might imagine that having all these people in the same room was great. We got all sorts of debate going on and all sorts of uh, ideas being exchanged, but then it kind of comes hard to come to consensus. If this committee with all these different people is expected to publish something, well, what exactly can you expect them to publish? The result were these was this, these sets of reports that were very broad and high level in terms of what they discussed. You know, we want to talk about educating users on these capabilities. We want to talk about getting internet into hands of people. We want to talk about people being secure in their information, but also information being able to be used for uh, opportunities like commerce, and we want property to be protected. Nothing that really sounds terribly objectionable, but it was very broad and high level and it represented really the base uh, agreement of what the such a diverse group of people were able to come to. Uh, now, as I mentioned, we had that thing with the IP committee and their very specific rules. There was also the Communications Decency Act uh, proposed by Senator James Exxon. It, that would have um, made it illegal to show any uh, obscene content to a minor uh, through the Internet. Now, uh, imagine trying to enforce that without severely crippling the Internet as we know it. And in fact, um, aside from the public outrage that it provoked, um, it was declared unconstitutional the very year after it was implemented based on uh, free speech issues. Uh, but the question is that, you know, the people who were from outside government who were involved, they had different levels of impact because some were, you know, people, the general public who were involved were pretty far back. They were you pretty, some, some of them were very aware of what was going on. Some of them were very much less aware. Remember, we didn't have the internet to easily keep track of these things. So people had to do a lot more work to figure out what the status of these issues were and to even organize any types of protests or write a letter or anything like that. And then we had this council that was a little closer to the, to the action because they had this formal affiliation with the IITF. But again, they were sort of one member among many. Uh, who were all together trying to find the consensus of where people from all these different directions were coming from. And that seems like it'd be a little straining. So that was basically the policy that was happening. Oh, and before I forget, what actually happened with all this IP controversy? Well, there was this, this, this big back and forth. It actually took years of debate between the IP committee and the uh, groups of academics and um, <clears throat> the groups of academics and universities and uh, other libraries and other folks who found it objectionable. But eventually there was sort of stuck through the back door and a little international treaty provision and a, a lot of the usual politicking you might expect. And eventually we ended up with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has caused no controversy since then. So, sir, now we can go to the Internet Society. And if you've been wondering since the beginning exactly what that is, wait no longer was founded by Surf and Khan in 1992 with the belief that the internet is for everyone. You know, this is, a, again, a pretty big change from the research network of just the decade prior. Um, and they recognized that as this network became more prominent, there were going to be issues that developed, and very key social and policy issues that developed, uh, that, it was, that something like this really needed to be around to address. Uh, its initial... Uh, 
its initial uh, focus was to really sort of help the Internet's technical development through something called the Internet Engineering Task Force, which really focuses on sort of protocol and packet engineering. But as it's developed, it's got this outreach, it's got pillars from outreach, technology, and policy. So today, the Internet Society actually has its hands in all sorts of Internet-related activities, from, you know, comments on policies like SOPA to sponsoring international Internet organizations like the Internet Governance Forum to uh, even management of the .org domain system. So the Internet Society really represents one of the first attempts, one of the first efforts to get more people involved, people who weren't interested, who weren't already in policy or government or had any reason already to know much about what was going on with this thing. Today it has about 100 chapters throughout the world, including one right here in New York, to address the concerns of its local members. And another key organization that was founded in the late 90s was the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It was basic, it's, this is what is in charge of managing the domain name systems, IP allocations, and protocol port numbers. This was a job that used to be handled by John Postel, but unfortunately um, he, uh, he left, he, he, was, he died in the mid 90s. So uh, they decided that uh, he was such a powerhouse that they need an entire corporation to do his job. Since then, uh, there have been some long-standing concerns over ICANN's transparency and the fact that it was established by, a U by the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce as opposed to an international organization. This, is what le this has led many people who are uh, from outside the U.S. involved in Internet governance to basically say that the U.S. controls the Internet, which I think is a, you know, a little reductionist, but it did remain a uh, long-standing issue. Now, for those of you in the know, you might be aware that ICANN has recently announced it's ending the contract with Commerce and it tends to move into an international body, but exactly how that's going to happen is yet we're, we're not really sure. Um, and also, if you've heard something about the global top-level domain, that's ICANN's doing as well. And finally, this also, these organizations like ICANN and ISOG really point to something called the multi-stakeholder model. Now, what is that? This is a change from, for those of you who are not political scientists, I'll fill you in, uh, the traditional means of diplomacy and governance and um, policy agreements uh, on a global scale was done through multilateralism. This is uh, comprised of established states and diplomats and uh, transnational corporations. We're talking about people on you know, these types of scales here which seemed appropriate before we had something like the internet. Uh, it was difficult to ha synthesize information about what was going on and we as a people couldn't really communicate our, um, our interests and our ideas so effectively to, to uh, the government. So we kind of needed them to do a lot of this for us. But as the internet came into being, we had this multi-stakeholder model which seeks to bring every stakeholder in. That means if you are a user or otherwise involved with the internet in every way, you have a stake. But exactly how are we going to do that? And to this day, there isn't really a clear definition of what the multi-stakeholder model actually is or how it works. This graphic that I've got here is actually the, clo the only version, the closest thing I've found to any sort of definition of a multi-stakeholder model, any sort of clear definition. But even then, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And you can start to see how the history has led to a very open questions of internet governance that have, um, and that's why we see a lot of debates today over issues like SOPA and Snowden and other issues in the internet where a lot of things really haven't been settled or defined all that much because they weren't defined back then either. But we do see how a lot of the discussions today mirror some discussions that were happening years and years ago as well. So the internet is a very young medium still, especially when it comes to its time in, um, in the public forum. And in terms of uh, understanding how it's going to be governed and used, it's, it's very much remains an open.